Good evening, everyone. I'm Robert Doerr, the president of the American Enterprise Institute, and I welcome you all here to this, I think, important conversation about a topic that I've cared a lot about for my entire career. And I'm so honored to have a great and dear friend to AI and to our country, former Senator Phil Graham with us, Thank you. and his co-author, John Early, to talk about their wonderful new book, The, um, the Myth of American Inequality, How Government Biases the Policy Debate. And I mentioned that this is an important topic to me because uh, before I came to AI, and then for a while while I was at AI, I spent all of my time focusing on people at the bottom of the income scale and how we could help them move up. And I had seen and felt, both when I worked in these programs in New York City and New York State, and when I wrote about them here at AI, that we had made progress that we weren't getting credit for because the official statistics of the United States uh, did not account for that progress in an accurate way. And there was something wrong with the way we were telling each other the facts about what was going on. And now, uh, the, the topic is not entirely new one. I think our two co-authors would acknowledge that others before them, Nick Eberstadt, uh, uh, Scott Winship, Michael Strain, uh, even Charles Murray had written about this topic at the extent to which efforts we make in reducing poverty or reducing inequality seem to be go unaccounted for in the official statistics of the United States. But what's great about this book is that it pulls it all together in a comprehensive way and actually gets to new ground about what this effect is having on the feeling about our country among Americans a little further up the income scale. And we'll get to that in a minute. But the, my job is really just to introduce and turn it over to our speakers, let them speak for a while, and then they'll pause. I'll have some follow-up questions. We'll get into a dialogue and a discussion, and then we'll open it up from questions from all of you. Uh, I just want to remind everyone who doesn't already know it that Senator Phil Graham is one of those rare things. He was an academic, a good academic, an economist, who became a politician and a great United States senator. And now he's back writing and thinking and is an AEI scholar. So Senator Graham, it's great to have you back with us. Thank you. John, there you go. A little applause for Senator Graham. Uh, really one of the great heroes of our, of our country. Uh, John Hurley is a statistical economist who has served as the assistant commissioner in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. He's written and thought about these issues for a long time, and he is, of course, a partner in, in describing the true facts with Senator Graham. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, to Senator Graham, to take it away and give us the, the story, then John, then, for, then conversation. Well, first of all, thank you for coming, and Robert, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for AEI. <laughs> Uh, I'm very proud of my association with AEI, and I appreciate everything you do. Um, the fundamental building block of our assessment of our individual well-being is the census estimate on what income is. And over the last two decades, that estimate of income has increasingly conflicted with other government statistics that have been calculated by the Census, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and by other government agencies. Economists from Bruce Meyer here at AEI, uh, across the spectrum, who've looked at uh, consumption levels, who've looked at wealth accumulation, have increasingly found an unexplained gap between what they observe people spending and what the census measures people as having earned. Now, let me give you two examples of the conflict. From 1947 to 1967, the poverty rate in America, the number of Americans who were deemed to be poor by the definition that we've set out in the government, plummeted a massive expansion in prosperity broadly shared. And then in 1967, the decline in the poverty rate stopped. And for 50 years, it has fluctuated roughly between 16% of the population and 14% of the population are measured as having been poor. 
But yet, during that same 50 years, the real value adjusted for inflation of transfer payments to the bottom 20% of American income earners has risen from $9,600 to $45,400. And yet, even though we are providing benefits worth $35,000 to, on average, to families that are in the bottom 20% of the income distribution, it has had no measured impact on poverty. Obviously, uh, that raises some fundamental questions. A second anomaly is every quarter, the Bureau of the Census presents data on what happened to income in the previous quarter and what it is measured as in this quarter. In the same quarter, the Bureau of Labor Statistics presents data on consumption. And for the last 20 years, the bottom 20% of American earners have on average spent twice as much as their measured income. The second quintile has spent 11% more than its measured income, and the top quintile has spent only 50% of its income, even though there's no financial data available that suggests that people are saving 50% of their income. Now, how did all this happen? Well, what we have done is we have gone back to the 1947 uh, system set up by census to measure income and looked at all the decisions that have been made since. And basically the conclusion is that the Census Bureau does not count two thirds of all transfer payments by the federal, state, and local governments as income to the recipients. Even though census numbers are routinely compared to tell us what has happened to income equality, the census numbers don't adjust for taxes. We found that if you uh, count all transfer payments as income to the recipients, if you deduct taxes paid from the income of the people who pay taxes, most of whom never see the income, that whereas the census says that the ratio of the top quintile of earners to the bottom is 16.7 to 1, we find that it is in fact 4 to 1. Now look, in a free society, you can debate what the level of income distribution ought to be. But it's much harder to argue that we ought to be redistributing more when the number's four to one rather than 16.7 to one. We have also found that for the last 50 years, the explosion of benefits, means-tested benefits going to poor people has been so large in real terms that it has far outstripped earned income, especially earned income after taxes, and so the bottom 60% of American households today, for all practical purposes, have the same income. Especially when you adjust for income size. Now, needless to say, if you have low skills and low earning capacity, and you can have an income from the government that puts you in middle income America, there is relatively little incentive to work. And sure enough, over the last 50 years, the labor force participation rate among the bottom 20% of income earners has declined from 68% to 36%. We look at poverty and find that if you count all transfer payments as income to the recipients, that the poverty rate is not 14%, it's about 3%. Uh, we look at Income distribution over time, the economist tells us it is a truth universally accepted that inequality in the developed world is high and rising. 
uh, Bernie Sanders says that it is obscene and unsustainable, we find that when you take into account all transfer payments as income to the beneficiaries and taxes paid as income loss to the taxpayer, that the, uh, the income, that the, the, um, the, that, uh, the, the ratio of the top to the bottom quintile and the Gini curve, a measure economists use, is lower today than it was in 1947. Now, let me tell you the toughest part about this book is convincing people that it is possible that we are having a debate in America about whether to fundamentally change our system to deal with growing inequality when inequality is actually declining. And it, it's hard to believe that. But read the book. <laughs> now, we look at why earned income distribution, the amount that people actually earn, is becoming more unequal. And we find the two largest sources of inequality are people dropping out of the labor market because opportunity in America is in a job and in the private sector of the economy. The second largest cause of income, earned income inequality, is differentials in the quantity and quality of education, primarily at the primary and secondary level. We look at the ultra-rich, the mega-rich, that basically end up being the focus of all discussion about inequality. Uh, and we address the issues. Do rich people pay their fair share? The answer is yes. Um, and it, we look at uh, Piketty's and Say's studies and basically show that they produce the result they produce because they count no government transfers as income and because they artificially inflate the income of high income individuals by counting capital gains that are never received because the assets are not sold. Uh, you remember when, uh, 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 Pluba, what was the group that had the stolen data? Public. Pu yeah. They had this, the, the stolen tax data, but it didn't show what they wanted to show. And so what did they do? They did a bait and switch where they looked at the income on the tax return, but they didn't look at the taxes paid. They looked at what the income would, they looked at taxes paid, but they looked at what income would have been had people sold the assets they own and taken the capital gains. So by inflating the income, they produced the result they wanted to produce. Uh, we look at mobility. 91% of all people born in the bottom quintile do better than their parents in one generation. 70% of the people born in the top quintile do better than their parents in one generation. We look at cross-sectional studies, including Mike Strain's work here at AEI, and we combine it with other studies to show that mobility is alive and well in America. Now, there is a return to parenting. Good parents pay off. Look at Asians in America and their extraordinary success. Um, uh, but it's better to be born rich, beautiful, and brilliant than be born poor and uh, ugly and ordinary, but poor, <laughs> ugly, and ordinary Americans succeed every day in this country. The level of mobility to us is extraordinary. Now, there's as much water in a glass as you want to see, but we make the case, and I think we make it very strongly, that mobility in America is alive and well, and so is the American dream. We look at the last 50 years and the progress we've made, and it's been an extraordinary 50 years, the most maligned 50 years in American <laughs> history. But the, the facts speak for themselves. 
This has been a golden age and would be called that in any other country in the world except America. And then finally, we look at policy conclusions. We need to get the Congress to force the government to include all income and taxes and all its comparisons. Simple. And we look at ways we could improve mobility. Liberals want to talk about American fairness and income inequality, but America never promised equality of result in the competition of life. In fact, we celebrate uh, the fact that some people are successful. Uh, in the words of Will Durant, freedom and equality are eternal and sworn enemies, and where one lives, the other dies. We chose freedom, and we're proud of it, and it, it shows up in income inequality, but the promise of America is opportunity, as Lincoln said, a fair chance and open way. And we show that if we had a mandatory work requirement like we had with AFDC to bring people back in the labor market, and if we gave more choice and more freedom to people in choosing the education of their children, especially in inner cities, that we could dramatically expand the amount of opportunity in America. And John, you tell them how we did all these things. <laughs> right. Uh, thank, thank you, Phil, for setting it up for me. And thank you, Robert, for the invitation. And awesome. thank you all for coming to make this uh, hopefully a rather exciting uh, uh, dialogue once we get through with uh, laying out the facts. Um, so I'm going to lay out, embellish on a few of the points that Senator Graham made there uh, with, with some, some specifics of the data and, and methods, uh, but we can't go too deep. Feel free to ask questions when the time arrives. The data we have about income levels uh, at the household level, about equality of income, about poverty, all come from the same fundamental source, which is the census estimate of uh, household income. And this is the distribution of that income in 2017, uh, about $13,000 at the uh, uh, lowest quintile or fifth of the population. I'm talking about quintiles, that's the lowest fifth. And the top fifth quintile uh, is an uh, income of about 220,000. So that data is the foundation. It can be arranged in a number of different ways, explained in a number of different ways, but that's where all the official data is related to household income come from. And the difference between the top and the bottom, as Bill said, is a ratio of 16.7 to 1. Uh, and numbers of that sort are built into the entire set of data based on it. Uh, two basic, point, two basic uh, components of that data are earned income and uh, transfers. Uh, earned income comes from work and savings. Uh, transfers come from government. Uh, this shows that distribution, and we're going to parse that here uh, in a moment. So let's start with the earned income. The blue uh, curve there is the census measure, but it leaves out several things. At the high end, it leaves out, believe it or not, uh, capital gains. Uh, you know, Phil mentioned that, but there are real capital gains. These are the real ca realized capital gains that are here. Uh, the other folks uh, added some that you hadn't realized yet. So that's missing, as is some other investment income. At the middle level, we're missing uh, earned uh, income from the employer paid benefits, most particularly uh, health insurance. And at the bottom, there's some miscellaneous uh, failures to collect the right data uh, on the part of the census. Data that, these are failures that they know about but have not adjusted the official data by. Oopsie daisy, hang on. Okay, uh, so that earned income is a ratio of 60 to one now. So there's a much higher ratio of earned income, but this is the value added, this from either working or giving your capital out, that people earn in the economy. And so we wanna look at what are the causes of this inequality? And the biggest one, single one, is the behavior of prime age adults between the ages of uh, 19 and 20, 65 in terms of their participation in labor. In the bottom quintile, only 36% of the work, workers constitute only 36% of the prime age workforce, okay? 
at the top quintile, it's more than 100% because you have a lot of people working that are beyond both in terms of older and younger than the prime age workforce. So right there, we've got a big difference by who's working. And when they work, they work half as many hours in the bottom quintile, and they work twice as many hours in the top quintile. And that difference in labor participation and uh, uh, engagement of, in work accounts for about a third of the income difference. Okay, this is just the earned income now. The next 25% comes from differences in education. Of course, obviously, a, a BA degree earns you 70% more income than just a, a high school diploma, and so on. Um, then with, uh, after that, your choice of occupation within education. A master's degree in library science earns you half as much as a master's degree in biological science. There's another 2% that comes from experience. Uh, any, the average person in the workforce over their work life will double their real income. Uh, so that adds 2% to the difference. There's another 18% uh, from employment income uh, that we haven't yet been able to parse all the details out on, but we know it's from employment income because uh, we have the, the total data. And then the final 17% comes from uh, earnings uh, on savings. Okay, so that's earned income. But now we, uh, we've already heard that transfer payments affect this a lot. So there's the census data. Uh, the biggest single thing in uh, census transfers are Social Security, but it includes unemployment insurance, workers' comp, uh, uh, temporary assistance to needy families. But that's about all. They only include about six or eight programs out of the more than 100 income transfer programs. Uh, and there's a whole lot missing. Two-thirds of the total is missing. Uh, examples would be um, the refundable tax credits, the Medicaid, uh, food stamps. Why aren't we counting those things? They're not counted. So we counted those, and we've got a total. And now we look what happens. The difference between the top and the bottom is no longer 16.7. It's only 5.7. So we've uh, gotten rid of about 90% of the 60 ratio in earned income, and we're now already down to less than what the census said it was, because census didn't count all the transfer payments, even though they didn't count some of the income either, which we also added in. But then taxes come in, because what the government giveth, the government taketh away. And we've got a little red and orange shading showing there where that is. 7% of the income in the lower quintile goes to the government. 35% in the top quintile goes to the government. And so once we have done that, we're now down to the point, if you look at that dashed line, which is the income after transfers and taxes, it's only 4.0. So that takes out an additional 30% of the, the inequality uh, in earned income. But it's not just the difference between top and bottom that changed, it also changed between the middle and the bottom. Look at the little uh, rectangle down there. Mm -hmm. And we see that the sec first, second, and third quintiles are essentially the same income. So look at this, this chart here is the same data, just in a different format. Uh, and you can see here that the second quintile has only 8% more income than the bottom quintile does, yet, 2.8 times more of their prime age workers have a job, and they work 17, uh, two, you know, they work uh, uh, about 17 hours, uh, they, I'm sorry, they work nearly all full time as opposed to the 17 hours in the bottom, bottom quintile. And then the middle quintile has 32% more income, but they have three times as many people working, and they work twice as many hours, okay? So, that doesn't give you a whole lot of incentive to work. Government can replace most of the money you lose if you decide not to work, which is why the workers as a proportion of the adult uh, prime age population dropped from 68% to 37%. Now, uh, Phil mentioned the uh, size adjustment. Uh, we look at a number of them. There are three that are commonly used, and I've just averaged them here for brevity. But look what happens. Those bottom three quintiles have almost exactly the same size adjusted income. Uh, you know, the bottom, uh, the bottom quintile receives more 
uh, income actually on size adjustments than the second does by 5%, and uh, the third quintile only has 7% more. Yeah, size adjustment is the number of people living in the household. Okay, thanks for mm -hmm. borrowing <laughs> that. Okay. Uh, okay. These statisticians speak a different language. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I'm an economist. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Gini coefficients. Some of you have heard of that. But this is not some uh, fictitious cr critter that lives in a bottle, a fellow's name. But it's a measure of inequality. Zero means absolute equality. Every household has the same amount. One means all the incomes in one household. Uh, census publishes that going back to 1967. Uh, they have archived uh, tabulations that allow us to take and extend that back to 1947. Uh, and this shows an increase in income inequality. But before we get too excited about it, let's notice a couple things. There are some discontinuities here. All of a sudden, there's a big jump in, 19, uh, uh, in 1993 and in 2013. And in both of these cases, without going into the details, census changed the way it collected and processed the data. There was not any change in actual inequality, they just found more income at the top. Uh, so they never, however, adjusted the series for that. So it looks like the income was getting 30% more unequal over time. Uh, but they did, however, publish data that we were able to use ourselves to, to adjust it, and instead of uh, rising 22 or 24% over time, uh, it adjusted and rose only 16%, which says that the official numbers were rising half again as fast as they were supposed to. And then the missing transfer payments and the missing taxes, when you add those in, it's basically flat, actually dropping 3% over the last 70 years. So if you count all the numbers, it makes a difference. Finally, let me reference poverty. Uh, Phil began that, uh, laid the groundwork for that, noting that this rapid decline by half of poverty in the 20 years following the war, Second World War, and then so Johnson declares a war on poverty. So what happened? He expected it, poverty to go down more and for people to shift from getting handouts to earning their own income. And well, poverty continued to decline for five or six years there, but it followed the existing trend and then it stopped. And poverty then just oscillated between 11.1 and 15.2% over the next 50 years. Nothing changed, but yet we quadrupled the amount of money we were giving people as government transfers. Well, if we adjust for putting all those transfers back in, lo and behold, uh, the poverty rate drops to just 2.5% as opposed to 12.3, okay? And then if we make some adjustments in the way they improve their threat calculation of the thresholds, that is say the levels at which people are declared to be poor, uh, it drops again to about 1.1%. So poverty fell, we just didn't measure it. And with that, I turn it back to you, Robert. Okay, so that was great, and that's a good summary of the book, and thank you very much for that. Now, but I want to, in your, in your Wall Street Journal op-ed, which you wrote as this book was coming out, you used a phrase, a blockbuster finding. I think that was the term that was in there. And it referred to this, this thing that we may have missed if we went too fast or weren't paying attention about the higher income at the end of the transfer payments and the taxes for people at the bottom who work very little compared to people in the next quintile and the one after that who work quite a lot. And I wanted to ask you, and there was a little bit of reference in your op-ed, what effect do you think that has on the people in the second and third quintile's attitude toward America and transfer payments and the situation that we have in our country? Well, I think we both need to answer the question, but let me start by saying that it is a blockbuster finding that you've got people who are working very hard and struggling to make uh, their mortgage payment, and they are now living among people who aren't breaking a sweat. Um, and uh, this creates a resentment uh, that has shown up in our politics. But also, as we looked at the bottom three quintiles of income earners, 
you're struck by the fact that so many Americans are still working when they could be about as well off by not working, which is a great testament to this country and its people. But the tragedy uh, that gets missed in all this is what happened to the people that were working when 68% of the bottom quintile was working, now only 36%, those people for 50 years have been left out of the American dream. I used to tell my mama that we were lucky that when I was growing up that they didn't have this welfare system because my life would be very different if we did. And my mother would always say, what in the hell are you talking about? I would have never taken welfare. And I'd say, well, Mother, if you were in the system today, everybody you knew would be on welfare. Uh, the government would be telling you that you're owed the welfare. Uh, you would have taken it, and our lives would have been very different. And my mother said, if you ever tell anybody that I would have taken welfare, I'll denounce you. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is... They are the real victims here, because it's not just money, it's people's lives. And how much talent was out there we never discovered. People that could have done great things, or even little things that to them would have been their achievement. Uh, sort of my reaction to an overreaction, but anyway. <laughs> oh, uh, Robert, unless you, you've got another question on that point, you want a little more detail, well, I think I, you covered I, it pretty one well. One question I do want to have is just on the technical issue of the, of the definition of working and not working. Is it working, could you work, if you were in, the, in that data set, if you worked half time, would you be counted as non-working or working? Okay. Yeah. This is this is this still uses the current population survey uh, AS, AS, ASEC uh, supplement definitions. So this is for the year 2017. If you did not work, you did not work one bit for for pay anyway. Okay. Uh, so this is then the amount you worked is reflected in the hours. Okay. So they they about one third as many in the bottom worked and they worked half as many hours. Because there is an element of the safe transfer pay payments that does require uh, showing some work activity. So for instance, the refundable tax credits that are tied to earnings, the earning income tax credit, you have to show a little bit of work, not a lot, but you have to show some to get the transfer payments that sort of sups up your, your earnings. So I'm, I think there, I definitely think that the point you're making, which is that people who work really hard and don't seek assistance, are ending up about where people who work either none or a little are at the end of the day. And that can, that, can, that can make people feel as if, why are they doing all this work when others are getting equal income for less work? And that well, is a, and a problem. And there are some people that want to say the way to address it is just increase transfer payments to the people that, that are in the middle of the second and the third. And I wonder how you react to that. Well, I don't have to react to it. We have numbers. When we increase the means-tested transfers to people making $125,000 a year of market income, what happened to labor force participation rate? And, and let me say, look, we're trying to start a debate. We're not trying to end the debate. We're not saying we figured all this out. We're not saying that what we say is the end of the story. But what we're saying is that there's, there are issues out there that have got to be addressed. And if you got a better answer than we have, we'd like to hear it. Uh, but you can't neglect the fact that we're grossly overstating inequality and that our policies are creating real problems for the country. And we're debating making the policies worse based on data that's wrong. And John, you feel absolutely certain that the, the effect of other transfer payments is to disincentivize work and is a well, leading cause or the primary cause for the decline in labor force participation. Well, there, there's a kind of a two-step there. The decline in labor force participation, or, and, and it's specifically of those prime-aged adults that we're talking about there. Yes. That decline is definitely responsible for a third of the income inequality. That, that much as simple arithmetic. And, the, and while correlation is not cause, 
it's clear as clear as anything ever is statistically that the the level of payments you can get for not working has clearly affected people's willingness to work, yeah. and we shouldn't be surprised about it. Right. You quote you you cite Casey Mulligan also as another economist who's had findings on that as well. Yeah. So that leads me to you know the issue that was quite popular and still is quite popular among some, uh, and that is to expand the um, non-work tested in any way uh, transfer payment of a child tax credit. This was a very big and very expensive component of President Biden's Build Back Better proposal. And it is, there was a news story today that Senator Bennett in Colorado is still eager to keep trying to get that in during either the lame deck Congress or in the next session. Given that that is another transfer payment without any connection to work, how do you react to it, uh, given your findings today? Uh, I think it's clear that it will reduce labor force participation rate. Uh, and it won't reduce child poverty because the census does not count refundable tax credits as income to the people that get it, even though you get a check from the Treasury. Uh, and this was a decision they made based on their decision not to count taxes. Uh, and so uh, there's nobody with a straight face that can stand up and defend a definition of income that says a check you get from the Treasury is not income. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if somebody from uh, the census wants to come over here and debate it, I'd be happy to stay here for a week and debate it. Uh, clearly, this is, fu is a fundamental problem. Now, how it happened, we don't get into that debate. Uh, but the fact that it did happen and is happening, we're very much in that debate. Do you want to comment on the child tax credit, John? Well, let's say it would be unfortunate. Uh, because, I mean, it is another transfer. Uh, it, it would uh, put a damper on labor force participation, for sure, and on earnings. Uh, and it's also going to what? Reallocate resources. So you lose efficiency. You, lo you lose productivity. You lose growth. It would just be, uh, you know, uh, very unfortunate. Yeah, as an old politician once said, if you get everybody in the wagon, who's going to pull it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that old politician was you, I thought. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, the, uh, the, now, I, now I've got one other thing. The, the, one of the elements in the book that is in the tone and the way it's written, and in some of what you said today, especially when you talked about the 50 years of rem remarkable accomplishments in the United States, was that um, now that you've counted it correctly, I want to just see if I got this right, um, and seeing that the child poverty rate or the poverty rate is so low, as Bruce Meyer and other scholars have shown as well, um, we, should, we should say, it well, that we at least have accomplished that. I mean, do you think raising the material well-being of Americans so that there are fewer whose material well-being, whose resources in their households, is there are many, many fewer of them who are below the poverty threshold. Do you view that as an achievement? I think you can say that, yes, it's an achievement in a sense. But in another sense, as it induced the labor force participation rate to fall from 68 to 36. Among it, those in the bottom among quintile. Among those in the bottom quintile, it it cost them ex access to the American dream. So was the intention good? Yes. Did the policy produce good results? Uh, it's at least debatable. I would say no. The, the thing about achievement is it belongs to you. It's something you did, small or large, it's yours. When government gives you something, it gave you something. But when you earn something, when you build something, uh, 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 it's yours. And, and that's, the, that's a value that you can't provide with transfer payments. John, you want to add anything on yeah, that? Yeah, I think another thing to, to, uh, to think about here is that, so 
Poverty for children has become smaller and smaller. As the income has gone up, and here's your poverty level, you know, there are fewer and fewer of them down here. There are more. And, but what happens then in our policy is that we gave money down here to people that were down, and they moved up above the poverty level. And then some of them began actually to, to earn money, and they moved up. But now we said, oh, that, instead of applauding and moving on ahead, what we did is we started giving more money to the folks up here. And that's, and that's, that's also detrimental to uh, uh, labor force participation. Um, I want to ask about health insurance. You, so you count in your calculations, I believe, and, and maybe this is more for you, John, or either one. Um, so government-provided health insurance means the premium for, for insurance is paid for by the government. Um, tell me exactly how you use that in these income data and why you use it in the way that you do. Well, there are a couple of different things. First of all, for private uh, insurance, uh, we include as income the employer's contribution to the, to the premium because that's income. You know, they paid for 20%, 40%, and 100%. census doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. And census doesn't do that. Uh, the other is that for Medicare and Medicaid, they are, in effect, insurance policies. For Medicaid, it's all government paid. For Medicare, uh, the beneficiary pays anywhere between 20, zero for the lowest 20% pay, pay zero premium, up to uh, 80% of premium for higher income people after retirement. Uh, but so the, what you pay in premium is not a transfer payment, but the value that you get in excess of what you pay for premium is a transfer payment. Uh, let me also add that on Medicare uh, and Medicaid, uh, you can obviously question what, what the recipient valued it as, uh, and that's clearly debatable. But w with Medicaid, the recipient is getting something government paid 70 cents on the dollar for. You can't go out as a private citizen and buy the health care that Medicaid provides uh, at the same price the government did. Yeah. So people say, well, Medicaid's not worth what we paid for it. Well, it may not be worth that much to the person who received it if they would like to do have done something else with the money. Yeah. But it's we, you're, everybody in this room that's paying for private health insurance is paying for part of Medicaid by paying higher premiums. Um, in, the, in the way in which you adjust incomes and resources in households, you do a lot on the bottom, obviously, that isn't counted. And I guess I wanted to ask you a question, political question. It seems to me that people that want to increase transfer payments uh, because they believe there should be more transfer payments or there ought to be a universal benefit income or people shouldn't have to work, whatever they think. This Census Bureau mistake that's gone on for years that allows people to say things and cite official statistic that's inaccurate is good for them politically. They, they've they gotten a benefit out of this, this inaccuracy in the official data that, that they've been able to use falsely to promote what they really want. Well, first of all, I, I'm willing to say that the people using the data don't know it's false. Uh, but clearly, I mean, just take the, the poverty level. All of these programs were expanding. You know, the president said last year that we were going to cut child poverty in half uh, <laughs> by the, uh, the uh, tax refundable credit. tax credit. Well, tomorrow... The data comes out from the census, and the official number is going to show it didn't happen. Why? Because refundable tax credits don't count right, right. as income, and so they won't show up. Now, they'll find a way to fudge around it, uh, but uh, I think, again, that we're in on this treadmill where there is a problem because the census says there's a problem, and we're going to deal with it by providing money. But then the problem's not solved because census doesn't count the right, money right. as income. And so what we've done is we're now in the name of poverty giving money to people that hadn't been poor in a generation. Yeah. And yet there are these 2 or 3% of the people who've fallen through the cracks that because some special problem they have, they've got legitimate needs that are not being met because... We have acted as if 
the more money you give in these transfer payments, the more you're helping the poor when the poor, the people that are getting that money are not poor anymore. Um, okay, next question has to do with the top end. So are, do we have a, uh, internet, compared to internationally, did, did you find that we have a, a progressive tax system that, 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 is, that takes more from well, well off people than, than other countries? Believe it or not, the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. the most progressive tax system in the world the top 10% of Americans pay a larger share of taxes than in any other country on the face of the earth. And the bottom 90% pay a smaller share of the taxes than the bottom 90% of earners pay in any other country on the face of the earth. And, and that data relates to- Now, let's just repeat that for a second, because you, you've started with the progressive impact on the top. It's well known that the top 10%, or well known among some, pay more than any other country in the world. But then you said the bottom 90% pay less than any other country. Yeah, less as a proportion of their income. Now, we have a smaller government than a lot of other countries. But Believe in it or not. terms of sharing the tax burden, and let me also say, it's in another part of the book that didn't get much discussion here, but there, there seems to be this idea that if we took the income of the super rich that we could pay for all this government. Well, if you took the entire income of the super rich, it's not rounding error, but it's not going to pay for government. We're talking about paying for government for a few weeks. Uh, the income that government collects that pays for government comes from people like us. Um, and, there, yeah, and one thing just to add to the data that Bill was laying out there, that was data on taxes with respect to income tax and payroll taxes. So it doesn't include the fact that in most of those other countries they have VAT, that then of course adds more tax to the bottom end. And so it's, it's even worse than that. Well, one other thing, when you have census report all the data to the uh, OECD, we don't rank as the country with the most income, with the most uneven income distribution. We rank solidly in the middle of the top seven countries in the world. Um, final question for me, and then let's open it up to the audience uh, uh, who may have even stronger and more tough questions. Who knows? We'll see what we get. Um, just as one of your recommendations, you just say point blank programs that provide benefits to low income Americans that don't have any kind of work expectation should work requirements. So that would be food stamps or SNAP, public health insurance, um, housing assistance. These are things that pay no attention to work engagement. The only program that does is TANF, which is the cash aid program. These other ones haven't, and, and if, they, if they did ever, it was a long time ago and they've been sort of washed away. Um, you, you would advocate bringing them back be, be, because of the benefits of work and because of the fairness to the people that are working? Is it both those points? Yeah, and let me tell you, one of the things we show clearly is that unmarried women with children that have been subject to a work requirement, remember we reformed AFDC mm -hmm. and had a work requirement. And even though the work requirements have been waived, those family, those households have a higher work participation rate than people of similar incomes. And the most successful program of my legislative lifetime was reforming AFDC, which we call welfare reform, but it was of only a small slice of welfare, but it was overwhelmingly successful. Uh, it, uh, people went to work, they built new lives, uh, their income went up. Uh, uh, it was a great success story, and I think it needs to be replicated in every means-tested program, and not because I, I mean and I want everybody to work, it's because working is what life is about. It's what fulfillment is about. 
It's what progress in America is about. We're cheating people with these programs. Now, some people can't do it. We help them, but for the people who can, we should ask them to do it. Okay, so I'm going to turn to the audience now, but I also want to let people know that for those of you who are watching in and have uh, what questions from wherever you are, uh, you can send them to katrina.fee at aei.org. That's C-A-T-R-I-O-N-A dot F-E-E at aei.org. Um, or you can post them to Twitter with the hashtag, hashtag American Inequality AEI. Um, for the rest of you that are in the room, I'm looking uh, for some questions from all of you. Um, and so I'll just look around and see what we've got. Yes, sir. Wait, wait for the mic. Methodological question. Did you attempt, or is there a way to uh, calculate informal work at any quintile? Unpa untaxed work, unreported work? Uh, not question. too much. Uh, there, there was some that, that have been detected in looking at the lower income levels uh, through a work that was done by a joint effort between uh, the Economics Department the University of Chicago and Census itself. But that's only at that level. There's not too much good data on that one. That's a place we would like to get more data, but we haven't. Yeah, one of the problems is if people don't report the income, it's very difficult for us to gauge that they actually worked. And for many people in the casual economy, um, uh, if you try to hire somebody to do uh, uh, some work on a temporary basis, they won't pay them it in cash. So we're probably underestimating work participation and people are being paid twice for it, once for being, if they took the welfare, um, and uh, once for actually working, paid in cash, but never showing up on the data. And of course, illegal activities are never measured. Uh, so none of these uh, measures are perfect, and it's, uh, it's important to understand that. But I think census does a very good job of measuring what it measures. The problem is it measures the wrong things. Senator, I want to follow up on that question because that's a very good question. Because if you spend time in low income or communities in America, and you refer to the strength of Americans uh, in, in your remarks, um, you, it's, there are some places where there's just a lot of off the books work. And so, oh, that yeah. some, so that when we talk about people that are benefiting in the lower quintile from these transfer payments, it may be that they've just found a way to work and receive generous benefits, and in some way, they at least are getting the benefit of working. I mean, or, they're, they're, or they're at least have, they have the dignity of working. They just happen to found a way to take advantage of the generosity of America. I, I don't disagree with that. I, um, I think people are probably better off working uh, at where it's not reported than just not working. Yes, that's what I'm uh, But I don't, you know, we don't have the data on it, and I'm very, we're, we've decided in writing this book to be very careful about talking about stuff that we couldn't back up with the facts. Now, the fact that we can give circumstantial evidence here and there is great, but, yeah. and that works in politics, but in what we're trying to do, since we are not so stupid as think people yeah, aren't yeah. going to attack what we said, right. that we've tried to be very careful. Okay. It's in the back there. Young man, then I'll come to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, my question was just uh, about long-term changes in family structure over the course of the middle of the 20th century. And basically my question is, to what degree can changes in, to what degree can varying employment levels in each quintile of the income distribution be explained by different family structures? Particularly when you consider the rise of single parenthood at the bottom of the income distribution. Why don't you want to take a crack at that? You hear better than I do and got the question better. <laughs> um, the, so, uh, let me just try to re rephrase. So by increasing single parenthood, that would imply that there's only one 
earner per household rather than two earners per household. Um, and that, that would be true, but, we, but we're looking at only, because when we work the tables out in the book, you'll see one of the changes is the number of workers per household. Uh, and so when we calculate the effect, these effects, we, know we've, we also get the changing in the number of workers per household as well. Uh, now, in a more complete systemic look at it, of course, when you have more two worker, two earner families, I mean two adult family, two adults in the family, then you're going to be more likely to have a, uh, two workers in the family rather than one. But uh, we're only looking at the total number of people that, that are working. And at the, at the top, remember, uh, you know, almost 100% are working, whereas at the bottom, almost not, uh, you know, only about a third are. So there is some of that in there, surely, uh, but. Uh, it's not the overwhelming. When we calculate the effects, we we also hold constant the number of workers. Yes, ma'am. And wait for the mic is coming up. Um, it's, it sounds like some of the problems with the data um, have to do with historical artifacts. Um, Talk right into the right, mic. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, it, it's also a, transit. It, sa it sounds like some of the problems with the data are just um, historical uh, accidents or artifacts in the data, and I just wonder about um, other international statistical agencies. Maybe some of the other countries have results that look better in terms of inequality or poverty levels because their uh, statistical agencies have had other methodologies over the years. That's, that's what I'm wondering about. International comparisons and different methodologies. Yeah. Well, when we, uh, when we looked at the income inequality across the OECD uh, countries, and it's been said, you know, that the U.S. had the highest inequality uh, of any of the major industrialized countries in the OECD, that, was, that is part of the, part of the problem, uh, in that we're not counting all of our transfer payments, and France counts all of theirs, so far as I can tell. Uh, and there is a methodology section of that data, and I went and read it all. Uh, and we do it to ourselves. In other words, if, if we submitted the same data that the French did, and that's what part of the data we say is missing, and we've added it back in when we did the calculation, we would look a lot different. Uh, and in fact, if you look at another set of data, which is based on the national income and product accounts, and the percent of GDP that is spent on transfer payments, we spend more than anybody except the French, more than the Germans, more than uh, the Brits. Uh, and uh, so that says we're spending that money, but it's not showing up at the other end of where the income comes in. Yeah, I also, the OECD, in responding to an article we wrote that is, and the basic material is enriched in the book, argued that it is not fair for America to count Medicaid and Medicare as transfer payments because they ought to have socialized medicine like everybody else. But the point is we don't. And if they are test their, they don't go to everybody. You've got to be old to get Medicare and you've got to be at least by some definition poor to get Medicaid and so they are transfer payments. There's no question about it. And so when you count them, our situation improves dramatically. Uh, but uh, countries do have different accounting standards. And in my opinion, OECD ought to be trying to deal with those instead of trying to outlaw uh, countries having low taxes. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, any more? We got one more. And, and then one, oh, let's go there, there, and then there. We'll have to finish with Mr. Miller. That's good. Then we'll go to you. That's good. I am so delighted to hear about this book and to see Phil Graham again. I have heard this analysis from AEI in the past, and I don't know why we can't have a convention that every year when the census puts out their analysis of the data, there should be a companion report, the tax and transfer adjusted poverty report. Maybe when the Republicans take the House, they could do something about that. Here is my question. 
I think about what is going to be the left's reaction to this. And my immediate thought, you know they're going to immediately go to ethnic groups as to what's been the story for them. And without going into too much detail, I, I would like to know, do you deal with that in the book? And do you, good story, bad yeah, story? Yeah, we what's do, we do to a little bit. Okay. Um, you know, we can't, you know, we don't do more than the data will support. But nevertheless, the same basic story applies uh, to... Uh, African Americans, because that we have a long enough history on that, um, and they've they've improved vastly in terms of their unemployment. I mean, their poverty rates. They've improved vastly in terms of their family incomes, uh, and so the there's still some differential, but the differential has gotten much, much, much smaller. You know, like by a factor of ten, uh, and uh, you can do a little bit with the Hispanics. Uh, because we've got a bit of a history on those, but uh, the, the, it's a good story, what, the data that we do have. Yeah, I, let me just add to that, the, the achievement of Asians in America is extraordinary. And the achievement of Hispanics, uh, they're, they're, the, the middle income quintile is 21% more Hispanic than it would be if you drew people at random. Uh, this is a great success story that is not told, and blacks have made great progress. The, the point is, when you, have, when you present the full data picture, the last 50 years has been a period where we created a great cornucopia, and it has been widely distributed. Did everybody get the same amount? No. Did everybody contribute the same amount? No. I didn't get as much as Elon Musk, <laughs> but I didn't create anything like as much as he created. The point is, Elon Musk created more than he got. We are all richer because of it. I don't ever intend to buy an electric car in my life, <laughs> but some people do. And the man is clearly a genius. And he, he's earned every penny he made. And why would anybody envy it when we benefited from it? Uh, it's, a, it's a concept I don't really understand. Okay, we've got one more. We have, do you have a question? You do? Then bring the mic. Where's the mic? Is the mic coming? Right there. Right there. No, there, no, right, all the way. Come up forward. The ball head guy. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this result is extraordinarily important. And as you point out, it's built on the work of others as well as your own. How are you going to communicate this result? It's politically explosive. If it were known and understood by the electorate, you would have a substantial change in public policy. How are you going to get this out? What is your program or plan for communication? Well, let me say that to this point, a lot of the things that we develop in detail in the book have been developed at a, at a, a less detailed level in Wall Street Journal articles. And, and we've gotten a lot of comments, you know, I thought Graham was dead and I'm disappointed it's not the case. <laughs> but nobody has assaulted the fundamental underlying data that backs up the argument. They've said they don't believe it, it's not true, how could anybody believe it? But they don't show the argument. What is going to happen? What is, is the census going to come out and respond to this? We are beginning to affect their behavior. But I think there will be a hope that it'll just go away. Uh, that it, this is a debate that, that, that people that want more government don't want to get into. Now, there is a legitimate debate about how you value transfer payments. We, we don't have the last word on any of these things. But valuing it zero when you're getting a check from the Treasury, is that, 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 I'm glad I don't have to try to sell that argument. Uh, so we're going to try to go all around the country to the extent we can and put the ideas out there. And uh, we believe ideas are powerful things. 
that ideas, both when they're right and wrong, have more influence than we know. Richard Weaver, that was. Yeah, okay. Uh, and we think that there are powerful ideas here, backed up by what we think are strong arguments and what we believe are the best available, is the best available data. And so we're going to present it, and then is the question, you know, the Bible says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But he left it up to us to ferret out the truth. And so uh, it's, it's awfully presumptuous to say it, but we think we got much closer to the truth in this book than we're getting in our government reports that are being issued. And I, I would just say also, if you don't mind, just the, the knowledge about the, the inaccuracy of the poverty measure is now very well accepted and agreed to. And there's just no way left for people who use that official poverty measure to go and not sound like they're using it to advance their own agenda uh, dishonestly, is my view. So, um, well, this has been a great discussion. Thank, Thank you, you gentlemen, very much. Thank Thanks, you, audience. Thank you. Thank you.